All right. Hi, I'm Emily Tate, a reporter here at EdSurge covering early childhood and K-12 education. Um, EdSurge is a news and information resource helping bring you the best in education technology through our news stories, research programs, and community activities, which include live conferences and events such as this webinar. Uh, at the end of last year, EdSurge joined ISTE, the International Society for Technology in Education, ISTE is a nonprofit organization that serves educators interested in uh, the use of technology in education. For today's webinar, we've lined up three experienced and thoughtful educators to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on K-12 students and school communities. During today's discussion, we'll be focusing specifically on social emotional learning, mental health and well-being for both educators and students during this crisis. A quick note before we begin, this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available to you via email after the live event. If you signed up for the webinar, you'll also receive updates about recurring web webinars on this topic. We are planning to host them weekly as we have done for the last few weeks. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature in Zoom and we'll bring your questions to, into the discussion as we're able. We also encourage you to use the chat to say hello, introduce yourself, and share resources, but please do be sure to put your questions for the panel into that Q&A feature. Um, also, you may have heard about some cases of Zoom bombing in the last few weeks, so if for any reason we have unwelcome visitors in the chat, we will be closing out that feature. Um, before we get started, I want to draw your attention to a new guide from EdSurge and ISTE. It's called Navigating Uncertain Times, How Schools Can Cope with Coronavirus, which collects all our stories about COVID-19, including our contributors' stories, and some really helpful resources. I'd encourage everyone to take a look. It's online at readiness.edsurge.com. I also want to point you to a new site from ISTE and a host of other education groups called Learning Keeps Going, which also features tons of resources, including an educator help desk. That's online at learningkeepsgoing.org. All right, now I would like to introduce the panelists for today's event. I am so grateful and pleased that they were willing to share their time and expertise, and expertise with us on short notice. Um, today we are joined by Chris Cipriano, Director of Research at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a research scientist at the Child Study Center at Yale University. Uh, we also have Amy Mason, principal of Madison County Elementary School in Gurney, Alabama. And last but not least, we have Chrissy Romano Arabito, a second grade teacher at Nellie K. Parker Elementary School in Hackensack, New Jersey. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. So I wanna kick off this conversation and then as I've mentioned, uh, we're going to move into taking audience questions. So one more time, I encourage you to use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, we won't be able to get to everything, but we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, so Chrissy, I'd love to start with you. The elementary school where you teach is located in Bergen County, New Jersey, which is just a few miles outside of New York City and has already confirmed thousands of cases of COVID-19. Um, can you just give us a sense of how your school district has responded to the outbreak and how your students have been affected by COVID-19 so far? Sure. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for having me um, and to be able to speak on behalf of, you know, elementary school teachers because we're, we're teaching the little ones and um, we're finding that they are really struggling. Um, so as you said, we're in Bergen County, which is um, right outside of Manhattan, uh, New York City and the five boroughs. And um, we are one of the hot spots, especially our county. Um, in talking to my students and their families, we're finding that just about everybody's been touched. Um, in some way by COVID-19, um, my family included. We've already had um, a loss and other people that are, that are sick. Um, so we, it, we're really trying to put the emotional well-being of these kids and, you know, we don't always know what's going on at home. So we're trying to put that first. So with that being said, we're doing the best that we can with what we have. Um, I think this whole thing happened. Um, like in a heartbeat, it came out of nowhere. Um, you know, we were in school on a Thursday and then Friday we weren't. Kids didn't go home with books. Um, they went home with packets. That, that was like the only thing we were able to do on the fly is to send them home with some kind of work. 
Um, but then very quickly, our IT team got it together and, and we um, gave out Chromebooks to any student that needed one. Everyone had a personal hotspot. Um, the plan was to do review work until spring break. It gave us teachers a time to plan together for some sort of home learning, remote learning, online learning, crisis learning, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're rolling that out, um, on Monday on, on April 14th. Um, so that's, that's basically where, where we are right now. And I just briefly want to follow up on that. So, um, as you mentioned, not everyone in your classroom has access to the internet. So what are you doing to stay in touch with them and, um, to help maintain that critical connection between students and teacher? Sure. So in the first three weeks, um, they did not have, now they do. I have to say that every single student has access to a device and a Wi-Fi hotspot um, thanks to the technology. You know, he was able to get that together. But in those first few weeks, um, we were encouraged to set up Google Voice numbers so parents and families were able to reach out to us via phone or um, by text message. So that was great. Um, so I've been doing that. Um, I've been calling parents. If I can't, you know, a lot of parents, they see phone numbers, they don't know, they don't pick up the phone for lots of different reasons. So once you text the message and say, hey, it's me, it's Ms. Romano, um, then they've been a little bit more receptive. Um, I also use Seesaw in my class, which is a platform that is, um, I've always loved, but especially now in this situation, it's, it's becoming a lifesaver. So I've been sending out morning messages um, via video and then kids video back so I get to see their faces and hear their voices. Um, Sometimes they call just to say hi. Sometimes it's, it's troubleshooting, you know, trying to get them up and online. Um, but I make a place to check in with everybody a few times a week um, just, just to maintain that connection. You know, I'm, I'm used to seeing the parents and families that pick up and drop off. And, you know, we're, we're a, a small community school. So I know all the parents. I know the brothers, the sisters. I've been teaching for 27 years. So many of the kids I have now, um, not only have brothers and sisters, in some cases, their parents. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're very close to it. Um, in, in Thanks so much. Um, and Amy, uh, you lead an elementary school in Northern Alabama, uh, just outside of Huntsville, where many students come from low income families. Um, this crisis has become as much an economic one as a health one. So do you have a sense for how your students and their families are managing? Um, as of right now, we have not had a lot of positive cases that have been ID'd within our school population, but of course that, that in Alabama is on the rise and so everyone's staying home. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing at our school is that we're able to provide some mental health services for our students. We are a Title I school and over 56% of our students qualify for free and reduced meals. And a lot of them come from homes that have a lot of outside challenges. If you're familiar, familiar with meetings or CARES this ACEs study, we have a lot of students with a couple of ACEs that, um, you know, we are concerned about those students. and and typically when they're at school, over 40 of them are able to see our on, on campus therapists that we partner with Wellstone Behavioral in Huntsville. And now that they're not coming to school every day, of course, it's a concern that uh, they're not maybe being able to have that face-to-face -face time in their regular counseling session. And our therapist has tried to do more of like a telehealth option to reach out to students at the home uh, phone or even a video chat, but a lot of them are taking advantage of that opportunity at the time. And I think it just speaks to the um, state of, of, of the situation in the home. You know, parents are being pulled different directions. We have many parents that are essential workers. And uh, oftentimes I'm learning as I talk to teachers and families, a lot of the parents are um, maybe putting the children with grandparents for right now because they're having to go to work and there's just not a way to manage the household that way. But um, we're hoping that as parents get more comfortable, we're also starting more of our blended learning platform on Monday of next week. And so the parents have the opportunity to get going with that. We're hoping they're able to make time for that routine because it is a concern that if we don't see them again until the fall, if they have gone unseen for any of those mental health needs for multiple months, we may have 
some um, even greater work on our hands when we return to school. Yeah, and uh, Chris, I want to turn to you now and ask if um, if what many children are going through right now um, across the country, if that amounts to trauma. I think you need to unmute. Sorry yeah. about that. Emily, thank you so much for having me um, here and Chrissy and Amy. Um, it's really, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate reality that we're all here to have this conversation, but I appreciate the opportunity to learn with you. Um, I just want to start by um, orienting myself to the conversation for our, our audience. So um, I'm at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, the YCEI, and here we use the power of emotions to create a more um, healthy, more equitable, productive, and compassionate society. We have an approach to social emotional learning known as the ruler approach, um, which is grounded in the theory of emotional intelligence um, about recognizing your emotions, understanding their causes and consequences, labeling your emotions accurately, expressing your emotions appropriately, and regu regulating those emotions effectively. Um, so, you know, our teachers and our students and our families, we're all managing um, an unbelievable amount of loss right now. It's a scale that's unmanageable. Chrissy, I'm sorry to hear that you've um, lost a loved one, a family member. Um, that's not an uncommon narrative these days. And we're also having the loss of routine, the loss of autonomy over how to spend our day to day, you know, soccer practices, concerts, celebrations with friends and families, the ability to grieve in the way we all used to. Um, at the same time, there is a tremendous burden to succeed weighing very, very heavily on our teachers, um, on their hearts and minds, on our students, and on our parents. And it's a rather daunting reality. So there's evolving requirements for distant learning, simultaneously supporting your students and their families while under a veil of ambiguity about our future. Um, depending upon your child's age, they may, not, they may have you know, direct knowledge of what's going on right now, um, and they may understand some of the feelings or emotions that are going on in their family's household, or they may um, be implicitly affected due to the financial strain that parents are under now, um, or just be responding to the effects of their routine being changed and not having to get up for school any day. I know that I'm dealing with that in my own house. Um, we, we have four children. And so they may be expressing feelings of sadness um, and frustration, confusion and ambiguity. And you know, the key to this is that we wanna promote healthy co-regulation with our children, um, between teachers and students, between parents and children, to allow us to move through the pandemic. And this starts by validating all of our emotions. So just as your kids and your students are experiencing a range of emotions throughout the day, so are you, so are each of us. And we need to own these emotions and allow them to inform how we interact with our students, how we interact with our children, to support them in healthy emotion management. There is no right or wrong way to be feeling right now. Every feeling is justified. Um, but there are strategies to help to manage your emotions in more productive ways than others. And we need to give our students and our teachers the skills and strategies to be able to do that so that we can foster resilience. And, you know, Emily, that was where you started. You asked me, you know, is this, is this trauma? And um, it's, it's going to look and feel different for every single family, every school, every teacher, every student. And we know that resilience is overcoming um, in the face of adversity and that it's built it's not built in. And emotion regulation is at the foundation of our ability to be resilient. So our brains and our bodies, they are malleable and they're built for resilience. And we can help to inform that resilience by providing ourselves with the ability to manage our emotions effectively. We can provide our students with opportunity to solve problems together and celebrate it when we do. And um, we also must always uh, maintain hope because you know, for all of us here, we're in this sense of not really knowing what's gonna happen next. And that's a very, um, it's a very difficult position to be in, but we need to maintain hope that there will be what's next and we will all come out of this together to help to foster that resiliency. So I'll just leave that for now. Yeah, thank you. And actually there's a question in the um, Q and A that I wanna bring in now. It seems um, directly related to what you were just saying. Um, Carrie Gallagher asked, when elementary age children ask about what will happen and we don't know the answers, because of course we don't, um, what is the best way to help them feel like their questions were answered, we, even when, you know, maybe there isn't a right thing to say? Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I will share that it's important for us to allow them to have the opportunity to feel the way they feel and to validate those feelings. 
So sharing with them that, you know, um, I, I'm scared too, or I'm, I'm not sure either when this is going to end, that I'm having feelings and um, that it's okay to have those feelings, but that we can, can't control everything that's happening, but we can control how we, you know, manage our feelings about it. And so we can create routines together. Um, we can find things to be grateful for every day and kind of enact some of those simple strategies, um, the, what we call kind of the, um, uh, the, the less explicit SEL, right? So it's not a curriculum coming off a book, but ways of interacting that promote their self-awareness and social awareness and positive relationship skills that give kids that sense of security. Thank you. And um, Amy, I know you already mentioned um, the tele health teletherapy and Chrissy, you mentioned how you're staying in touch with your students, but maybe um, one or both of you could share what else you're doing to just stay connected with the students in your classroom and your school and um, how you're making sure that their social emotional needs are being met. Well, I'll for that or start, you know, it's an ongoing effort. We're doing a lot of utilizing the adult resources from classroom teachers, special educators, and instructional aides to be checking in with students and families just to find out, you know, things that they need. Of course, um, offering some online instruction where they can interact and actually see the teacher's face. Um, but I think even more importantly, it's the groundwork that we laid prior to the time that we sent children home unexpectedly like this. Our school actually has utilized uh, conscious discipline in the primary grade as a SEL curriculum where it touches on exactly what Christina was talking about, making students aware of their emotions and knowing how to express those. And they have routines in the class where they're using morning meetings and restorative circles or um, even like as a group when they sit down together if someone's missing uh, miss wishing them well every day and these are things that children can continue to carry on at home um, if they're feeling stressed giving them breathing strategies and tools that they can use to help to regulate themselves and they're dysregulated so I think a lot of those are things that we're hoping that students are continuing to access when they're at home with their families. Chrissy, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, you're on. You're on mute. So you're there. Um, so similar to what Amy was saying, um, you know, we do have teachers that are trying to maintain what they're doing in school in terms of like morning meetings. So we've been using Google Meet um, to check in with kids and and um, you know just a a quick. You know, how are you doing? How's everything? You know, do you need anything? Um, like I said, we've been calling home. It's not just me. It's it's other teachers have been doing the same thing. Um, our local elementary school actually did a, a car caravan, went through the neighborhood of, um, you know, our students and, you know, we're beeping the horns and they were, came out and we were waving, you know, social distancing, of course, and just to let them know that we're there and we care. Um, we've maintained food service because we're a Title I um, school as well. And our school counselor is, is also available. So she's been checking in at the on those families that we already know that are at risk, um, or that we're now identifying as at risk. So maybe they weren't before. But, you know, if we know that a family has lost someone, or um, in one particular case, I have um, a student that both parents are sick, um, and they've been self isolating for two weeks. And you know, the eldest of, of all the children is trying to kind of maintain, maintain things in the home. Um, so like I mentioned before, we're, we're in, in a real, um, we're really in crisis mode here in, in Bergen County. Um, so we're just trying to keep in touch with kids, make sure that they're okay, that, you know, their basic needs are being met. Um, you know, I've, I've just been sending like little bitmojis, like through Google Voice, like on text message, so they can, you know, things that I want to do, I'm trying to maintain. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, a, it's a tough time for everybody. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I, I want to bring in another question from an attendee. So Chip asked, why are schools having trouble prioritizing. There is so much focus on instruction and expectations for teachers and students. Sometimes we mention having grace, but then priorities don't change. How can we shift this? Um, Amy, maybe you can start by answering that given the position you're in at your school. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, we've had these conversations in my home because as a, a school leader, I'm in that supervisory role, but I'm also a mom. I have two kids at home and they're both with me. And um, it's a challenge for all of us to try to really uh, be considerate about what we're expecting our staff to do with all of the challenges. And, you know, that's assuming people are healthy in their home or that they're not needing other resources during this time. And so I don't think we can make assumptions about you know, while they're home, they should have this time. I, I, I look at it very differently. So we're asking them um, weekly and uh, middle school teachers are, are touching in daily, which I think they have a lot more content that they want to cover. But for teachers in the younger grades, we're, we're kind of spreading it out that way. And then we're asking teachers to actually collaborate in the weekly as well so that those dialogues and, and that conversation can continue. Um, but beyond that, we're not putting a lot of additional feedback because it's important that we maintain the mental health of the adults as well as in this situation. Christina, do you want to add anything? I think, um, you know, part of, I really love what you said, Amy. Um, and definitely like, you know, in being an educator and then also having the personal experience of living through it with children, right? It's kind of, you can see both, can see both sides. And what I've been experiencing and kind of wrestling with from watching my own children in their respective schools and the demands that they're placing on them. And then from what I feel should be, you know, what, how we should be spending our time right now, which is really kind of protecting their emotional health and well-being, um, and, you know, and putting that at the foundation with, um, indirect opportunities for academics um, when we have the opportunity. Again, my children are younger, so um, we can we could talk about you know how that might vary across across time. But I think why we're potentially not seeing it as priority right now coming down from the top is because it wasn't always the priority. It wasn't the priority before this happened. Even though there was a definitely has been a, a, a large movement um, across the nation to embrace SEL standards and practice. Um, you know, it's, it's a slow moving wave. And so it's more and more teachers on in board, more administrators on board, more districts on board, but it, it takes time and it wasn't um, fully, in, fully in practice yet. Whereas some other um, requirements and, and mandates were. And so those are perhaps the ones that kind of went, you know, came first when school said, okay, now this is what we need to um, start requiring in terms of our, our mandates um, for student learning. So just my, my two cents there. Yeah, so Amy had mentioned that um, you know, it, she is falling back on a lot of the um, work that they had already done in her school to like laying the groundwork of this and already having that foundation of SEL. Um, but Chris, I imagine that a lot of people that are listening right now that are attending this webinar don't have schools that have made that priority yet. So, I mean, if, if you're just trying to build from scratch um, in this very uh, delicate time, what are some things that that people can do with their students? Sure. Um, so, you know, we can think about like the big buckets, um, the, um, the big dimensions of social emotional learning that CASEL provides us with a framework of, of uh, self-awareness, social awareness, uh, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and uh, self-management. And we um, can think about ways that you could encourage conversations and interactions with between students, so peer-to-peer between teachers and students, and then also to give parents some language. So one thing that comes to mind immediately is like gratitude and thinking about gratitude during this time. So um, finding opportunities for, and there's lots of resources available through, um, I know we have uh, our resources at the YCEI that we're making free and publicly available, those through CASEL and our related networks of ways to, um, you know, find what you're thankful for, ways to start conversations and thinking about being thankful. Um, my children went on a gratitude walk the other day around our neighborhood and my five-year-old daughter was um, found a red stick that she decided was a parrot and so she was grateful for the parrot um, but embracing the opportunity anyway you get the idea also thinking about things like um, some of the practices that um, you know many educators were already doing in their classrooms before they were moved to distance setups um, regard regarding group work and problem solving those are presenting uh, great opportunities to, you know, think about like leveraging the digital technologies or platforms that are available to, uh, if students are old enough, engage them in group work, engage them in uh, ways to have conversations with each other or um, solve problems, um, providing parents again with some questions that they could talk to or ask um, their, their students about, uh, ask their children about at home, 
to start um, kind of moving in that direction. So um, there's, you know, a, many of us, if not all of the SEL field right now is basically making everything available to try to help to support teachers and students and parents um, during this difficult time. And we all want nothing more than for folks to start to take it up and use it. And um, I will say though, you know, although emotion regulation is something that um, can be taught and we can, you know, we can talk about the different skills and strategies of how to do that, um, it, um, it is something that, you know, requires work. So it's, it's free in the sense that you can, you can learn it, but it requires work and time and um, it's very important that you are a model of that and a co-regulator with your children or as a teacher with your students, um, as a teacher with your students' parents uh, throughout this time. And so um, leveraging those resources and kind of spending a little bit of time digging into them, you know, free and publicly available as a starting plate um, would be another recommendation of, of where to start. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump in also yeah, and me. mention that we've done a lot lot of the questioning that Christina was talking about, even with the staff, um, because they're experiencing all of these different emotions. So when we've had faculty meetings with teachers, just kind of talking about, you know, what are some positive things that you're looking forward to being able to do to support instruction for students from home? And um, so I think it's just trying to, with all stakeholders, provide that lens of like, how can we look at things in a, from a positive of angle because we're in a time of, of a lot of negativity. Yeah, Chrissy and Amy, to, um, to what extent are you uh, communicating with parents and families during this time? Obviously, they, they're, for, especially for younger kids, very much involved in the, the education right now. I, I mean, for me, um, constantly. Um, if they call, I pick up the phone. Um, sometimes it's 10 o'clock at night because of their work schedule. Um, you know, our administration wanted us to stick to a very structured school day schedule. Um, and I'll be honest, on paper that looks fantastic, but in reality, it doesn't work at all. Um, I have a student living in a shelter. I have more than half of my students, the parents are essential workers. So they're still out and about, and some are home with older siblings, some are home with babysitters all day. So they don't sit down and do their work till seven, eight o'clock at night. So as far as I'm concerned, if they're calling me at 9 30, 10 o'clock at night and they need help, I'm picking up the phone. What am I doing? <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, we're not going anywhere. We're around. Um, and I just feel like, uh, you know, I, I'm always there for them during the regular traditional school day. And you know, even when the parents message me at night, I always answer. It's just kind of who I am and, and the relationship that I've built with them. I don't want to turn that off now when I feel like they need it now more than ever. So I, I'm reaching out every day with the morning message on Seesaw. So they get a little video message from me every single day. And then if they feel that they need to reach out um, more than that, like by texting me or calling me, again, I respond and I pick up the phone. There's a few families that I make a point to reach out to at least three or four times a week because of special circumstances. Um, you know, I, I also don't want to inundate them. You know, I'm seeing a lot that parents are saying, uh, my husband teaches middle school. So these kids have nine different teachers. And if nine different teachers are reaching out every single day, it's getting to the point where the parents are like, stop, stop. It's, it's too much. It's overload. So it's well intent intended. Um, but on the other end, you know, it's, it's a little overwhelming. So I've gotten to the point, I guess this is now week four for us, that I've just asked, you know, how do you feel? Like, what, what do you need? Just tell me what you need from me. Um, if you want me to check in every day, I'll check in every day. If once a week is good, I will do that. Um, and, and it really, you know, it really just, it really does depend. And my colleagues are doing the same thing. So I don't want to act like, you know, I'm the one who's doing all this. We're all doing all this. You know, we're a small community school in our town. Um, we are very close knit in Hackensack, even though it is the county seat in our county and it's a city, it doesn't feel like a city. I was born and raised there. My husband was born and raised there. We're both still teaching there. Um, our parents live there. Like we're very invested in the community and the uh, majority of our staff in Hackensack, you know, we're from Hackensack and like, this is, this is our community, even though I don't live there now, you know, my kids are my kids and those are my families. And like I said before, I've taught a lot of their siblings and I've even taught some of the parents, um, which is crazy when I think about it. But, 
you know, I'm just making myself available. And I know my second grade colleagues are doing the same thing as well. Mm -hmm. I think we've taken a bit of a different approach at my school. And um, I'm really thankful for the district level leadership in Madison County Schools, where I'm located. Um, they really asked us to not put instructional demands beyond two hours per day for each student. And I feel like that's a little more realistic. Um, students can always extend and read and do additional things and, and their own research if they want to expand their learning. But I think that um, with parents working from home, you know, kids trying to learn on online and, and depending on their age, they might need support of a parent. Um, it's just very difficult. I have a three-year-old and so, um, even for me, three-year-olds are, are not very um, independent for very long, and so it, it just, it's very difficult if you think about the number of children in a, a household together and, um, you know, whether if mom or dad is, a, is an essential worker, um, you know, it, it's just, we're trying not to put too much on our families. We want to be a supportive role for them. We want to educate students on the essential standards that they will need to progress to the next grade level. And that can be accomplished because typically at this time of year, we would be doing state testing and some other things that would take away from instructional time as well. So for our teachers, they're, they're hanging in on that with staff and I mean with parents and students each week. Um, middle school, like I said, is conducting that more frequently, more, more often. And then the teachers have off hours for about three hours per day so that while students are doing those lessons at home, if they need support, they have to Google voice numbers like uh, Chrissy had talked about and also email and we're using uh, Google Classroom as a platform for students to interact and, and do things that way. Um, we also have utilized Class Dojo as a tool that, that was in place again before we left and for students in the younger grades, we're able to send pictures or videos through that platform and uh, for those that are maybe not able to access internet because of geographical complications. Um, we're in a fairly mountainous area here in Huntsville, so some, some areas are just not able to get Wi-Fi despite a hotspot that we might give them. So, you know, just really trying to be understanding of the times that we're in. Um, educating students is important, but let's not forget about um, the base hierarchy of needs and, and we need to, to put that at the forefront of our thinking at all times. It was really, um, it was really validating to hear you both share, Chrissy and Amy, because um, we really, um, what I heard was an undertone of like flexibility in the experience um, and thinking about, you know, um, teaching in partnership with the family and the larger unit and understanding that academics are obviously a critical part of the puzzle, but so are kind of attending to all of those other demands and um, that those require, you know, a, just a degree of flexibility um, to be able to, uh, to be available to your students. But what I also heard, um, like Chrissy, I was just thinking how, wow, your students are so lucky to have you, um, you know, answering the phone at 10 o'clock at night and kind of, you know, going out of your way to, to differentiate across their needs and their family needs during this time. And, you know, there are many educators like across the country who do this every day in person and are doing it online in um, our, uh, our center with Castle, we launched a survey. Um, it was an informal survey um, as part of a webinar that um, my colleagues were putting together to be able to support the emotional health and well-being of teachers um, at the end of March. And um, we heard through their open responses in that survey over 5,000 um, educators who filled it out in three days, which is um, rather amazing <laughs> of a turnout that um, you know, our teachers are, are overwhelmed and they're anxious. And um, they talked about, you know, not wanting some more clarity on work-life balance and kind of the demands at play. And I, I kind of heard that in what you all were describing as well. Um, just thinking about, you know, when, when do you turn the screen off or turn the text messages off and how on the one hand, it's, you know, tremendously important that you're so available and so flexible to the needs, but at the same time, like, you know, this could be going on for a while. Like we don't, it's already been going on for a while, right? And we, we don't really know how long. And, um, you know, what is that doing to our teachers? And so I'm so thankful for everything you all are doing. And I'm also so worried at the same time um, <laughs> and that I want to yeah. make sure that you're okay, you know, and, and supporting you. Right. And so like, what are the, cause we think about like what we do as a, you know, in school, in the support of schools and, and we need to make sure we're attending to our own emotional health and well-being too, because it's not good for any of us to be kind of like on in that way all the time. We're like making sure that we balance it. Right. Which, right. um, 
can be a logistical impossibility right now, right? So we, had, we need to find strategies and, and ways to create those healthy routines and patterns. <laughs> So I, I guess, yeah, real. I just want to um, jump in on like a little bit of what Amy said and, and Christina. So Amy mentioned, um, you know, not overwhelming the kids with, with work. Um, so yeah, my district definitely sent out a schedule and they wanted to maintain it like a regular school day. Um, I'm not doing that. I'm basically doing what I know is best for my kids. I know my 16 kids better than um, with all due respect, better than the superintendent does or even the principal who sent out the schedule. So I, I'm going to, you know, we're starting full, full uh, remote learning on Monday. And, you know, I basically told them, here are the tasks. If you need me, reach out. I'm here. Um, you know, you have the entire day into the evening to get it done. Um, and if you can't get it done, just let me know. And so flexibility, like Christina mentioned before, is, has been really important. Um, so I, I am keenly aware, um, Christina, about the whole wellness and teacher wellness and self-care. Um, you know, I did a whole webinar for K-12, a simple K-12 on that not too long ago. So I, I do do things for myself and I know it sounds like, oh my God, she's available all the time. My kids know, but it's been the same all year. Um, it's not really new. If they need me and I can't get to them right away, I will get back to them. So there are things that I have put in place, um, routines in our home to maintain my sanity, my husband, my kids, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, but I will say I'm fortunate that my kids are older. So I have a 22 year old who's actually staying with my 91 year old mom, helping to care for her who lives alone. So she's there quarantining with her. So I have a 15 year old at home he's pretty good and, and self-reliant. So it's, it's my husband and me for the most part. So I, I do do things. And I know Emily was going to ask about this, like, what do we do for self-care? Like we have things that we do to take time for ourselves as well. So I am not work, work, work 24 seven. And I, I don't want to, I guess I, it kind of sounded like that. And that's not really what it's all about. I did make it clear to the parents. If I can answer, I will answer. So if I'm sitting there at night and I'm just crocheting and I'm not really doing much else and it's a parent that I know because of special circumstances, it's the only time that they can reach out. Yes, I will answer the phone for them. Um, but that's, that's, I don't know. I hope, I hope that clears it up. I, I just wanted to be clear that I'm, I'm not one of those go, go, go 24 hours a day and killing myself because I, I understand what burnout does. Um, you know, I, I understand what, you know, depression can do and having good days and bad days and that we have to be very self-aware um, of how we're feeling in addition to what's going on with our kids and, and their families. So Christina, thank you for bringing that up. But I just kind of wanted to clarify that, you know, for everyone that's listening, I'm not asking you to go out and be a superhero, although we are in the classroom. That's what teachers are usually on the, on a daily, but you do have to go out for a walk. If you're tired, take a nap. I mean, I'm, I'm doing all those things. I'm making time for you know, my hobbies, um, I'm baking, you know, when I never do that regularly. So my husband and my son appreciate that. So yeah, I'm definitely making time for myself. Amy, would you want to add anything about that? Yes, you know, I think it's interesting, Christina, because we can fall into that trap very easily. And I find that, um, you know, in, in my role, to have a good work-life balance, I kind of compartmentalize different areas of my life, but when I'm doing it all in the home setting, it's kind of hard to compartmentalize. Like, I don't know if I should put, you know, one thing in the, in the closet and then put something somewhere else, but I, I'm still managing that. Um, but with, with young kids, we've been trying to get outside every day. We've had some beautiful weather here in Alabama. Um, they've even been able to wear shorts outside. So that, you know, has been nice, um, you know, doing like spontaneous dance parties in the kitchen with the kids, things like that. They, they really enjoy. Um, but yes, we're, we're really taking the time to take care of ourselves. I feel like I've, I've been able to sleep maybe more than I have in, in years with young kids. So uh, that part's been really helpful too. Yeah, one of the neat things that um, our reading specialist in, in our school has been doing is hosting virtual cocktail hour, like happy hour. Um, so, so that's been neat. So people have been, you know, people in our school community have been, you know, popping into those little Zoom happy hours to just kind of keep it light. Um, my team, we FaceTime every day and sometimes we're just FaceTiming to lift each other up. If people are having bad days, um, you know, just 
some, sometimes just talking about other things, sometimes, you know, planning and, and whatever, um, keeping it light, but at, at least I am very fortunate that the five of us um, on our second grade team are really there for each other. Um, so we're taking that into, into consideration also. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obviously really hard to strike the right balance because as you already alluded to earlier, Chrissy, we can't pretend like we're busy doing something else. Like we're all in our homes. Um, so to some extent we are kind of always available, but I think we have to be able to be confident enough to just shut it down when we need it and, and recognize um, when it's time to separate from our work. Um, and I, I guess to that end, Chris or Amy, I mean, what are some things schools and districts and school and district leaders can be doing to support their educators uh, like Chrissy to make sure that during this turbulent period, um, they're not burning out? So I heard a, um, a horror story of what not to do that your question is reminding me of. I, I heard of an educator um, through my, my networks whose district is requiring them to kind of clock in and clock out for six and a half hours and be available on the computer during that time. And that was that particular district's um, kind of recommend, attempt really at um, saying this is the work time and this is when you know teachers can be accessed. So they were trying to create work-life balance for the educators, but what that's doing is putting right an immense amount of demand on that teacher to be able to be an instructional, you know, there to instruct during that time, as well as like if they have to manage their own kids at home and they're learning, right? So it's creating these um, these kind of uh, inaccessible expectations um, that could really uh, be the opposite of flexible, which is where we kind of started earlier, right? Of like thinking flexibly about what kind of demands we're placing and what kind of recommendations we could provide to our teachers so that they aren't um, burning out, but at the same time, providing them the opportunity and resources to allow that space to create the space like Chrissy, you were um, sharing about, you know, being able to like, go take walks and do your hobby and engage and that like, it's your choice that you're like kind of opting in. And we do know that for some people, um, it's really healthy coping for them to they seek distraction and they may seek work as a distraction. I, I am I am definitely um, guilty of that right now, um, in the sense that I will find myself looping back to it after my kids go to bed for a bit, but it's important for us to diversify, right? And to find kind of other opportunities with, a, with what resources and social circles we have available um, to, to do that. Um, so anyway, I guess the, to answer your question directly, Emily, um, you know, to, to not require the six and a half hour check-in, um, click in um, in a specific window in a specific time would be um, not be promoting um, educators well-being. Um, but be providing them with resources and supports for how they can access, um, you know, whether it's, uh, there's so many webinars and videos and supports out there right now floating around on the web. They were there before the pandemic and they will live on after the pandemic, right? And we can talk about the benefits for who, by who, right, across, across networks. And I know we've shared a couple of, I've seen a number of them coming up in the chat here. Um, that works for you, find what works for you in that space and, and take advantage of it. But um, if district leaders can model that and they could, um, request that of their teachers and kind of set that as an expectation as well that you are taking care of you during that time. I think that, you know, having the leadership model it um, and provide that flexibility could really go a long way. I wanted to piggyback too. I think as a school leader, um, so many times, you know, teachers are not in the profession for the money. We all know that, right? But like they want to be treated as professionals. And I think that this is a time that we can actually do that and execute that because you know, they're, they're at home, we're not checking in their classroom to see, you know, what's happening, but at the heart for teachers to care about kids and they're doing that, they're checking in on their students regularly, they're using this additional time to plan for instruction for what they're doing for the duration of the year or even, you know, planning in preparation for next year already. And so I, I really um, try to give my teachers that professionalism to know that you know, I'm, I, I'm not answering to them about all the emails I'm sending or different things like that. I know that they're continuing to carry that torch and do the things that are right. And um, I think that school leaders, that's something that we need to do to really show our teachers that we respect them and that we are trusting them. Um, we have a question from an attendee about some SEL activities you can do with your kids. Um, and then a related question about 
how to connect kids with each other um, in a way that promotes social emotional development. I was just going to add again about conscious discipline. I had talked about that before, and I've noticed if you follow them on Facebook or Twitter, they're uh, sharing a lot of free resources right now, and um, they have a social story that's around Schubert with their characters that they utilize and it, it talks about Schubert stays home and it's a great social story to help kind of uh, make kids understand you know why we're doing this and, and how we're protecting one another by staying home so there's a lot of free resources out there through conscious discipline that uh, would be a good starting point and I know you know feel free if anybody wants to email me afterwards there's a lot of different resources that we've used over the last few years to get our school SEL program up and running as well. Yeah, I want that social story. So I'll, I'll be messaging you <laughs> for that. If you could drop the link, that would be great. Um, I was going to say one of the ways that I'm promoting um, that my kid, well, we've done it all year. So it's, it's not all that different. Um, like I said before, we use Seesaw. And one of the things I love about that platform is that kids can view each other's work. That doesn't always have to be academic work because one of the things that the kids can do is drop videos in there, little selfie videos. So that's one of the things that we've been doing is um, opening up so kids can just check in whenever they want. So I have kids building things with Legos and then they come on with their little brother and sister and they show what they've built. Um, one kid went on a walk with his family and saw like a neat little chalk design and took pictures of it and then dropped that in Seesaw. So we were all able to see that and then comment on it. Um, you know, sometimes the whole family gets in front of the camera and they're like, hi, Miss Romano. How you doing? You know, and and I think that's great. Um, I've actually been out of work since February because I had emergency surgery, so my poor kids haven't seen me since before Valentine's Day. So, you know, I think in their little seven-year-old minds, they're still thinking like, is she still sick? Like, did she recover from the surgery? So sometimes the whole family gets on the video and they're like, How are you feeling? Are you okay? And and I'm like, Yeah, I'm good. So. You know, being able to see their faces um, and connect in that way. And then starting this week, now that all of my kids have access to devices and, and Wi-Fi, we are going to be doing a Google Meet check-in so that I will be available live if they need help with anything or if they just want to say hi and, and, and just check in. Um, and then, or, or I can just sit back and not see much of anything and they can see each other. Because if there's one thing that I'm seeing on social media from my teacher network across the country, um, my friends that are all over the place as well, that the kids are missing their friends. Um, they're able to see each other, I guess, in their neighborhoods, you know, social distancing, of course, but it's not the same thing of seeing your classmates every day. And, you know, my kids start their day with a soft start where they sit and they, in their classrooms and they have breakfast and they do puzzles and sometimes they color or read a book together or sometimes they just sit there and talk. Um, about what they did last night or I don't know, whatever seven-year-olds talk about. I think they're really feeling that void and they're, they're, they're missing that. So having that um, Google Meet like morning check-in, I think um, actually we're doing, I shouldn't say morning, we're doing it at 12 o'clock. So for those kids that need to sleep in for whatever the reason can sleep in and that, that's kind of like that middle of the day. Um, so that, that's, that's how we're doing it. We're also using... Uh, we're, I was just going to say real quick, we're also using Google Meet, but interestingly, um, one of our teachers in the primary grades has also found that she, she created a, a private group on Facebook and has done some Facebook Live with her students that way, and so it seems that a lot of parents, that's a tool they already have easy access to, so that, that's another platform that could be used that's not them having to learn another platform. Great. So I, um, I just, I was wondering, uh, Chrissy and Amy, if you are allowing any kind of like free time, you talked about like how your kids have the soft start in the morning, if you're kind of there to moderate, but just letting them have the socialization time on video, or, you know, if you're hearing any stories from any of your teacher friends, if parents are allowing for that to happen um, with like without teacher mediated or with teacher mediated um, to kind of preserve that same routine. Yeah. So I guess for us, um, we kind of have to moderate if we're doing a Google Meet. Um, we have to be there to set it up. They're also seven, so these kids don't know how to use 
sure. how to schedule or host meeting in Google Meet. I mean, we never right. used it yeah. prior. No, I just meant like opening it up and then giving them the time to have the conversation. Because I know I have a first and a second grader and that's been yeah. like a request has been like, like they want it, like, you know, their teacher will, yeah, you know, she does it every day, but then she'll shut up and like, my, one of my sons just really wants it to, to stay on. He just wants to talk to his friends. <laughs> right, right. You know? Well, you know what? I never thought of that, but I'm glad that you mentioned it. So maybe um, I'm going to see if I can even get the kids to join the Google Meet, like at that time. That's the other problem because of so many different unique situations at home. I don't know if they're going to be able to do that um, or not, but that, that's a great, um, a great idea to kind of be there. And be watchful like I am in the classroom when they do their yeah. soft starts. I never thought of that. So, I, hey, listen, you learn something new every day. Um, so maybe I will do that and, and just kind of take the back seat a little bit and give them that opportunity, kind of like recess, like when they go to lunch and they have their time to, to socialize. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you for that. I imagine, yeah, no, thank you. I imagine it could potentially be productive and just like you would, you know, again, if, it, if it's possible within the, the setting that you have set up, the, the age of your, your students, but, you know, then you can, you can learn from them, right? Because you can be listening to what they're yeah. sharing yeah. about. And then I know that, like, again, I'm not actively teaching in elementary school class right now, but I am watching my kids do it on their end. And I'm, I'm hearing what they're talking about with their friends, even in when the teacher is mediating it. And that's a jumping off point for me to kind of ask my, my children questions, like, after they're off of it to kind of learn from that information. So just like you would normally do um, right. when you're teaching, but, like, finding these ways. And I know that there are a myriad of digital technologies and platforms and folks who are, like, all over this in the ag tech industry right now to, like, rise to the occasion. So if you're like, oh, I wish this platform allowed me to do this for this age group, I think that, you know, teachers more than ever should feel empowered to be like, this is what we need um, so that somebody will build it because our entire country, if not world, is, is kind of in this space right now. Um, I also just, Emily, wanted to like move back to something you asked before about how we can engage in SEL at home, you know, at home and, and with our students. And, you know, there's lots of programs and approaches and, you know, some have been discussed today and like we have ours at the YCI, but, you know, more globally, if you're, you're not already using a program or approach or you don't have access to free resources, you know, something I, we could all be focusing on and trying to promote emotion regulation is asking our students, asking our kids, asking ourselves how we would help somebody else manage a difficult emotion, so how we would help somebody else manage anxiety. So we think more like broadly in practice. Um, sometimes it's easier for us to be able to articulate or draw for children, like how I would help someone else deal with something than it is for me to like find that strategy myself. And so you could think about like the students you work with or what's going on in your family and how you might introduce that topic, just like as you would in the classroom. And that can be a gateway to finding out what those strategies are that could work for that particular learner or for that student for that teacher, for that parent, um, because we're often much more insightful when we're trying to talk about it with somebody else. And so this is a, a practice of it's called psychological distancing. Um, but so it's just something, again, not program specific, but something that you could begin to engage in, especially if you're like, I wonder how, or like what could be the most productive way for, for that learner, for that teacher, for that parent. So I just wanted to raise that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we, we only have a few minutes left, so I wanna make sure we get to a couple other questions. Um, one that has to do with what I'm seeing in the Q&A forum um, and also the question I have is all three of you are both professionals and you're working, you have these um, responsibilities, huge responsibilities of, as we've discussed, um, but you're also parents to children in your homes right now who have needs. So what is that like? And I guess, how are you trying to sync up your duties and schedule as a parent with um, being an educator? So if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to start. Um, I have to say my, my son is easy. He's 15 years old. He is a, um, a classic introvert, quiet kid, so he doesn't require a whole lot. However, um, he does have a chronic illness. He has Crohn's disease. So, you know, we are, have been very, very cognizant of that since this whole thing started, you know, um, I think his last day of school was March 12th. Um, and he, he hasn't left the house other than to go, you know, in the front of the house or in, in the yard um, because his immune system is compromised. So he has to be really, really careful. Um, so much so that um, we're not even going to Mount Sinai, which every six weeks he was going there for his treatments, um, his infusion therapy. We have a private nurse who now comes to the house. So, I have that underlying anxiety and stress all the time. I'm constantly checking on him. Like, are you okay? Are you feeling well? And taking his temperature, um, you know, just monitoring, you know, for fear that 
some way, somehow, you know, we, we've, we brought the virus here. So for me as a parent managing work and whatever, um, I have the underlying anxiety that I'm trying um, to manage. So I hear a lot of my friends with little kids are dealing with other sorts of management issues, you know, like literally the, the little ones aren't napping like they nap at the school and um, they want attention 24 seven and they're dealing with, you know, all the feelings all the time and all this emotion. Um, so I don't have that stress or that management issue. It, it's just constantly in the back of my mind, you know, is, is he going to be okay? Um, so, so that's pretty much what I'm dealing with. But I, I got to tell you, those of you out there with little kids, um, I feel for you because I, I it, you know, trying to work from home, even if you're not an educator, a lot of people are just working from home in any capacity. Um, or even if you're working outside the home and then coming home and then uh, it's just a lot. It's just a lot. And I have a friend who has five kids and she's five kids under the age of seven. Um, it's, it's crazy. And she's going a little crazy. And, and I, I say to her all the time, you know, I'm up late at night because I'm not really sleeping these days. I feel like a vampire. I have like this whole crazy and I hear a lot of people, right? This crazy sleep schedule going on now. Sometimes she just calls me at one o'clock. She goes, I need some adult in her act. She's like, please, I've been with these kids all day. So the management isn't easy. Um, but I think Amy and Christina, you have younger kids, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to stop yeah. talking now and see how you guys are managing <laughs> I mean, it because I, I just, can't even imagine. Yeah, I'll just briefly share. So I don't have five under seven, but I have four, seven and under. So um, I can, can empathize with your friend. Um, and what's, I'm just being mindful of the time, what's been working for us, like to what degree you can call it working is just like scheduling, but like flexible scheduling, like what it is, isn't necessarily um, identified, but it's like who's in what space and sharing responsibilities with my partner. And never have I felt my privilege so much as I do now of having a loving and supportive partner to like be quarantined with together and that together we can like navigate this with our kiddos um, because it's, it's challenging. And um, our oldest is uh, medically complex. And so that's been a whole nother set of, so Chrissy, I hear you, um, like medications and getting them and all of his servicing stopping and dealing with that um, and like IEP requirements and what that looks like. And, you know, is telehealth or distance learning an option and, and how to navigate it. So it's, um, it's, it's a lot and every family's got a lot going on right now. And I would say that it's relative for all of us, like what this pandemic means and what it looks like in our houses. Um, and the challenges that we face, whether it's uh, food security, a roof over our head, economics, um, it's all relative. We're all going through a lot right now. And, um, and whatever you can find that feels like it works, um, just like hold on to it tightly. And for us, it's been the, the flexible scheduling, but like having a schedule, it's been really helpful. We're doing the same. So I have an 11 year old daughter, she's in middle school and um, she's required to do online learning, which has taken a couple of hours each morning. So while she's working and the three year old, I'm trying to structure some free play or other activities that he can do independently. And then I'll typically have a couple of meetings during that time myself as, as well as my husband. So everybody's just kind of going different directions, but midday we're trying to sit down and have lunch together and then get some time outside. And then um, we move on to the afternoon portion and at least he takes a nap. So we have that to go for us as well. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, um, may I share one more, one more thing? I know we're at time. I just yeah. wanted to mention for all of the working parents that are out there right now and educators who are working, nothing about this is usual. So we should not be expected to do business as usual. And own that you're being a parent too on video on your phone calls like our children deserve our full attention just like our students do and so we're all learning how to navigate this together but we won't uh, we can't expect a change in our expectations unless we show and we demonstrate that this is something that needs to change so we should not be apologizing for our children being present or any of the background noise you heard um <laughs> during this uh during during this call today so just want to like we, we can all do this together as parents and teachers so yeah. when my cat walks across my screen, <laughs> like, cause I'm dealing with that too. I, you know, he, he, all of a sudden it's like our, I'm seeing that, you know, that um, people are calling their pets, their teaching assistants and, and so on that um, I think they're feeling it too. I, you know, like, you know, we're worried about our kids and our family members, but 
Um, my cat doesn't leave my side. He's everywhere. Um, he's right here right now. And I just <laughs> kind of, you know, he followed me from upstairs to down here. And I'm just kind of like pushing him away because otherwise he would walk right across my screen. But um, Christine, you're right. We, we can't apologize for that. You know, we are um, partners and spouses and parents and, and, you know, we have other responsibilities too. And this is unprecedented and it, and it really shouldn't be treated as business as, as usual. So thank you for bringing that up. Chrissy, I think I've read something you wrote where you said, if we could all have as good of self-care as your cat who eats when he needs to, <laughs> sleeps when he needs to. Um, I forget all you said, but that was a really good analogy. <laughs> I'm yes, yes. That was in my, um, I, I did a, a webinar for Simple K-12 last summer. And, and yeah, one of the things I talk about is Duke. I mean, think about, our, think about our animals. What do they do? They sleep and eat and play, walk around a little bit and um, they know how to take care of themselves and they know how to do what they need to do to make themselves happy. So yeah, you're right. I, I did, I did say that about him. <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately we do not have more time. I, I'm sure we could talk about this, um, for the rest of the afternoon, but, um, I just want to say again, a huge thanks to the three of you for sharing your time and your insights with us. This was um, super valuable for me. I don't think you have to be an educator to, to get something out of what you have all shared. So thank you. Um, I hope that, you know, the people listening have gotten something out of this. And um, yeah, everyone just thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye.